I just got a text from Hugh Freeze. Uh, you, you ready for this? Thank you for seeking truth. <laughs> that's the most shit ever. Dude, that's the first time I've laughed today. My life for the last five years has been dedicated to reporting the destructive cycle of chaos that emerges from the NCAA's insistence that college athletes play for free. Stephen Godfrey had heard for a while about what was going on in Mississippi specifically with this investigation into Ole Miss that became national news when Laramie Tunsil was caught with a gas mask bong. All of a sudden, we have an image. It appears that Ole Miss was arranging payments for one of their best players. He'd also heard that it was starting to tweak and that an investigation to Ole Miss had started going into a player from Mississippi State, its rival. That's strange. Why is Leo Lewis in this situation? How did he get here? Leo Lewis is going to end up at Mississippi State or Ole Miss. He shoots an eight-second video of the cash. He puts it on Snapchat. How did Leo Lewis get sued? How did he end up as this notorious public figure? How did he become the most popular name in the state of Mississippi among sports fans to discuss and debate? By doing one thing, he talked to the NCAA. Now, after a year of interviews and hearings between the NCAA and rival schools fighting over him, his on-field performance is suffering. Soon, he has to get ready to go for the NFL draft, but he's being sued in civil court by one of the boosters he was compelled to name in an investigation. And the NCAA has yet to release their anticipated ruling on the case. Leo's about to face his enemies on the field. The most bitter rivalry in college football right now is the Egg Bowl between Lewis's school, Mississippi State, and their rival Ole Miss. Tiny, tiny. They face off next week, and it's going to be a hell of a fight. Oh. It took me five years to answer some of these questions. Who sabotaged Laramie Tunsil? five-year-long soap opera. You couldn't write it better. What causes corruption in college sports? Bombshell would be an understatement tonight in Oxford. Why do players keep getting targeted? They've been cheating in college sports since the dawn of time. In the water. And what is a bag man? Follow me down to Jordan Street. God's gonna trouble the water. I'm in Oxford, Mississippi now. Even though the Committee on Infractions hearing is over, we're still waiting for results. Usually it's anywhere from six to eight weeks for the NCAA to leave the committee and issue their written reply, to issue their ultimate decision. That time frame is blown out of the water because it's now November and the Egg Bowl is weeks away. Is it coming today? Is it not coming today? We don't know when it's gonna be. This is insane. Give me some sanctions. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me some sanctions. I'm joined now by Stephen Godfrey, of course, writes for SB Nation. Stephen, thanks for joining us. Yes, sir. Glad to be here. When do we finally think the, uh, these sanctions are going to be handed down from the NCAA, the Ole Miss stuff? So it's 70 plus days as we sit here and talk. So now there's a little bit of panic and frustration setting in from multiple parties because Ole Miss needs to hire a coach. That's the number one thing. But then everyone else that's, that's tied to this investigation in some way wants to get the verdict to figure out what their next move is. There was some thought they literally would postpone the decision till after the Egg Bowl because it, they didn't want to make the Egg Bowl more bitter than it otherwise would have been. Would something like that actually play into this? This is an unprecedented situation where you have these two hated rivals, and we're going to possibly have this decision come out 72 hours around the Egg Bowl. I think it factored in. They, they bring Lewis, who plays for Mississippi State and was one of the people who informed against Ole Miss. Could this redound 
against Mississippi State. And when you see a player from another school going on the record with immunity to rat out a, a rival institution, other schools look around and it's funny, they have they have two tracks, they either go, can we do that? Or is that going to be done to us in the near future? Thank you very much. Great talking to you. Always great to have you on the Thank air you. and wonderful delight to have you in studio. It's Turkey, Hoops, and Cowboys on Thanksgiving Thursday. Live on I'm getting the feeling from people I'm talking to that the NCAA doesn't know how to handle this. And that becomes another newsworthy moment to me is that they don't know what to do right now. On the Ole Miss side, they've already been hit with successive allegations from the NCAA and endured the firing of their assistant athletic director, Barney Farrar, as well as the resignation of their head coach, Hugh Freeze. Coach Hugh Freeze has resigned from his position as our head football coach. This is a sad day for the University of Mississippi. They're struggling through the season with an interim head coach named Matt Luke. Now the future of the roster, the coaches, and the entire program hinges on this one NCAA decision that just isn't coming. Tell me what it's like these last couple months on campus when you have something as kind of weird as the NCAA case, because it's not just, you didn't just lose a big game, it's almost like you're losing every day. This has taken a toll uh, on, on the psyche of the campus because it's been drug out for so long. People want some conclusion to this NCAA uh, investigation. We all just want it to be over with. It's just dragged on so long. Who's gonna get sanctions first, Trump or Ole Miss? It's my sophomore year and I feel like I want to like enjoy this year, but like it hasn't been that enjoyable considering what happened with our coach and our team. There is a sense that the NCAA is being unduly harsh. Maybe the NCAA is selective about which schools it kind of brings the hammer down on. I think it's a conspiracy. I think that um, nothing really happened. You can't help but think that we're being targeted. Tourism is a big part of Oxford, and a lot of that is rooted in football. When you consider all of the elements of the town that have to be involved with a game day weekend, right. um, from police to everything else, this is a very real problem. Mississippi State fans in Starkville are reveling in their rivals' misfortunes. Ole Miss has gotten away with so many of these things for years and years and years and years, and uh, nobody's ever held them accountable. And Ole Miss people have nobody to blame but themselves, their own coaches, their own administration. This year, the Egg Bowl takes place on Thanksgiving night. That's a game you have to win in a good year and a bad year. It doesn't matter. If you win that ball game, it's, everything changes. The grass is greener, the air is cleaner, and your girlfriend's prettier. The Egg Bowl will be played in front of a national audience on ESPN. And in a joint statement from the athletic directors for both schools, they plead with fans to be civil. But everywhere you turn in Starkville, there's some banner about Hugh Freeze and a hooker, or Ole Miss cheating, or Bagman, all that kind of stuff. There's a big spray-painted bedsheet in the tailgating section at Mississippi State that says, welcome cheaters. They're ready for this. on the sidelines while the NCAA stands between them. Finally, these players take the field to go to war. Let's go! A fight breaks out before the game even starts, and Leo Tonsil miss fans. Then the game starts, and it goes completely opposite of script. Ole Miss comes in like a house of fire. Mississippi State quarterback Nick Fitzgerald, he basically has his legs snap in an open field tackle. Nick Fitzgerald gets his leg and ankle bent awkwardly. Huff seem obviously very emotional. 
He's lost immediately, and the combination of the severity of the injury, but also the moment in time in which it happens, it just kind of sucks the life out of Mississippi State on the bench. You feel it and see it right away. The game that unfolds is brutal. Ole Miss players lifting a leg in the end zone to pee on the Starkville Bulldog fans. Ole Miss runs up a big lead. Mississippi State mounts a comeback late and almost comes back to win, but they run out of time. Ole Miss wins the game, and they win the Egg Bowl. It's very much a thumb in the eye back to the school that everyone at Ole Miss believes is at the root of their NCAA troubles, and not themselves. And it's a nice sal for Ole Miss for about a day or two. Then they find out that they've been hit by the NCAA. My sources tell me that the Committee on Infractions ruling is about to be released. Before that comes out, I'm going to publish a story about crucial developments in the case that happened in the hearing back in September. We reveal the identity of the third bag man in this story. Neil Lewis told the committee that he took money from the father of his teammate, Farad Green. Farad is a key witness that the NCAA used to corroborate Leo's statements about the Ole Miss investigation. He's a friend of Leo's, and his dad, Calvin Green, is a football coach at a community college that's a 13-minute drive north of Brookhaven, where Leo went to high school. What Leo tells the committee is that on the eve of National Signing Day 2015, in the same 48-hour period when he allegedly meets the Ole Miss bagman Allen to collect $10,000, he also meets with Calvin Green and received $11,000 in connection with the push to get him to sign with Mississippi State. This is a massive cloud hanging over the NCAA's looming judgment. It undermines any possible outcome and sanctions against Ole Miss, because what everyone wants to know is, where's the investigation into Mississippi State? Here's the really fucked up thing. Not only did Mississippi State pay more money to Lewis than Ole Miss, it wasn't even against the NCAA's rules. Under bylaw 12, the NCAA allows someone in Green's position family of a teammate to give normal and reasonable living expenses to a player like Lewis, as long as that person is not an agent or a booster for a school recruiting the player. We reached out to Calvin Green through his school, and he didn't respond to a request for comment on this story. 24 hours later, the NCAA officially announces the sanctions against Ole Miss, including a harsh second year bowl ban, the loss of 13 scholarships, show cause penalties for Barney Farrar and a two game suspension for Hugh Freeze, if and when he's hired elsewhere. Essentially, it's a mere slap on the wrist for Hugh Freeze. In the moment, Ole Miss feels like they killed us, it's, it's over. That second year bowl ban did it. So amongst all the penalties that are announced, this long list, there's an additional second year bowl ban and so some of the actual players in the roster can transfer right away. And there's going to be a level of attrition that's hard to overcome for Ole Miss. And the Rebels take a very defiant stance. That day they held a press conference and they announced that they're going to appeal and they announced that they're going to fight. We are deeply disappointed and angered by the additional penalty of a 2018 postseason ban. It is simply not warranted and is based on fundamental flaws in the NCAA case. It's just Leo Lewis's word against yours, and that, that was the main source of a lot of the information. So we are shocked by that based on all the mountain of, of evidence that was presented. But a lot of those bases will be a part of our appeal. The narrative from today is that Ole Miss has a culture problem with its boosters. If there's one booster that acts inappropriately, to me that's a problem, and we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to not have that. When someone gets up and talks about the sanctity of amateur athletics, or someone gets up and talks about the fundamental um, importance of the bowls, that's that's a I like that one too a lot. Um, you know wh why bowl games are good for communities or that kind of shit. I get to be the one that has full license to say 
a fuck you. Alan, AKA Bagman Y, has kind of dried up communication with me. He's been disassociated from Ole Miss. He's actively threatening lawsuits to keep his full name out of the press. He was sloppy, he was an amateur, and he got caught. Now, I'm still talking to other bagmen, people who do this across college football at all different types of schools. And one of my very first contacts was Bagman X. Now, according to him, as much as anyone, he views that Leo's not the problem here. There's an irresponsible bagman playing to an incomprehensible system. I would have never been in a parking lot. I had no idea why that guy was in a parking lot in a public place with an actual bag of cash. He thought being there meant something, like he was a big timer. It really means he was stupid. Billy Quinn was a lawyer for one of the Ole Miss coaches investigated in the case. His experience representing a client in court with no real system of law and no real chance to question Leo Lewis or any student athlete that testified against Ole Miss was extremely frustrating. In the absence of, of full and fair information sharing, really what you're presented with is whatever narrative they choose to present. And the only way of attacking it is through either a he said, she said sort of situation or through objective data to the extent that you can gather it. In the absence of the ability to confront your accuser, there is no way to find out from this person the details. Are they being led to an answer? What are their motivations? So how is it possible to accurately represent someone's interest if they're being pursued by the NCAA? It's hard. You weren't allowed to put Leo Lewis on the stand. You weren't allowed to put Hugh Freeze on the stand. The decision speaks for itself. I can't address those matters. The NCAA refused all requests to provide access to Leo for questioning or to share whatever evidence they found that made Lewis unreliable in the Mississippi State case, but not the Ole Miss case. The NCAA decided to make an example of Ole Miss. They went to the dirtiest cul-de-sac in college sports and picked out one house. And they said, you know what? You guys are the problem in the neighborhood. Except in college sports, it doesn't work that way. There's shit in everybody's yard. I can't imagine Ole Miss is the only school that's taking shortcuts in recruiting. I know they're not. Are other teams better at it? Do other teams make sure that whoever this is happening to, or whoever's getting paid, no one ever finds out about it? I really don't know. Even the lawyer suing Leo Lewis in civil court thinks the process is unfair, especially to the student athletes. When you look at the kids that are playing the game, for the most part, coming from very poor circumstances, and if this kid is, if somebody buys him a hamburger, that's technically a violation. Leo Lewis is, one of his charges is that we furnish transportation for him to go on his visits from Brookhaven, Mississippi to Ole Miss. Right. Got no car in the family, his father's not present, and how is that kid gonna travel four and a half hours to any school for a visit if somebody doesn't provide him transportation, a place to stay, and a meal to eat? As my team and I begin to dig through Leo Lewis's actual testimony, there's pretty convincing evidence of the NCAA's bias. What school or schools were you offered money by during your recruitment? Redacted. What school or schools did you accept money from during your recruitment? Redacted. What school or schools do you have knowledge of your mother are being offered money from? Redacted. And then what school or schools do you know that she accepted money from during your recruitment? Redacted. Is that the only thing redacted? That is the only thing. But in a non-public document, yes. with a lot of personal information, names and Absolutely, specifics, yeah. correct? Yeah. The only thing that's redacted are four lines that name the other schools that <laughs> might have offered cash. <laughs> that's nuts. The more he tells the truth, the more it's like, hey, 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 the system's not that screwed up. Exactly. It's like, yeah, it is. Exactly. Also, it should be pointed out that at no point do they have anything resembling a legal standard of evidence here? <laughs> no. Right? But because, it looks like, but it looks like law and order. Explain why they want it to be single case. They don't want what happened to come out. What they specifically want is a clear-cut case of inducement from one party to an individual that they can prove. That's it. 
they want a nice, clear, linear narrative that this kid was offered money by one individual yeah. to go to one place. They want a villain. So as of right now, Leo Lewis is still facing this lawsuit. Entering the 2017 season, as we reported on this story, Lewis was thought to maybe be as high as a second round draft pick in 2018. If he signs and makes money in the NFL, he potentially could have to pay it back to a t-shirt shop in Oxford, Mississippi, because of the things that he told the NCAA that he was compelled to tell the NCAA by the NCAA. Leo Lewis is a victim. Leo Lewis is a pawn. Leo Lewis has been used as part of this rivalry that spun completely out of control. And everybody who's using him today is going to dump him when they don't have use for him anymore. Who's Leo Lewis? He'll be the guy that was a snitch. People are gonna talk about it for a long time, which sounds so stereotypically Southern. <laughs> you just imagine like women in a hair salon, right? It isn't just a matter of players getting paid. There's domestic violence charges. There's the head coach having to leave for calling escorts. It's a five year long soap opera. You couldn't write it better. I think it's really hard to look at a kid who's trying to support himself and his family and make life better for them and put the blame on the kid. I think that the NCAA was really heavily criticized for where were you guys? In an era of bag men, in an era of social media hacking, in an era of multi-million dollar coach salaries, I just don't know if they've kept pace with that, which has made them, I think, ripe for a ton of criticism across the board. The NCAA has never made a public statement. It's never acknowledged publicly why they elected to sort of turn the corner away from Mississippi State every time the evidence led in that direction. I would like to know what's really going on, and my guess is because the NCAA is so bad and ineffective. They're an organization that's supposed to be policing, and they suck at policing. I don't even know why they exist in general still at this point, and I do feel like that's probably going to change. College athletes who generate all, all this revenue were treated fairly and had bargaining rights that everybody else has, this would just be commerce. Well, the NCAA doesn't want to change. They don't want to admit that their players have value that far exceeds the value of their scholarships. There's so much money involved and there's so much at stake for the players and for the teams and for the TV rights that like it's insane to me that they're not paid. It's the thing that creates this black market in this underworld. And if you would just pay the players, they wouldn't have to take it from bag men. What if every major program in the country were allowed to pay players tomorrow? But what would happen in this process? You'd have to actually pay these guys enough to where they could feel comfortable enough not to think it over when someone offers them a few hundred bucks every week or two or offers their family 20 grand. And I don't think college football will ever officially pay these kids and their families enough money. You know, the way they won't want to look twice at that kind of cash, that's just reality. Regardless of what happened in Mississippi, nothing's stopped, nothing's changed. All of this is going to happen again, no matter what the NCAA decides. There's no honest way for the schools to compete for players since they can't pay them, which is the way a free market would otherwise work. So the NCAA has turned the world upside down. No matter what punishment comes, no matter what school tries to do this next, this will happen again. A hundred times over, a thousand times over. As soon as you read about one, you can't you never get out of that, and then there's another one coming down the pike. We don't even know who the next Leo Lewis is, but we know they're probably playing high school football right now. Leo Lewis could be any high-prized college football recruit. There are dozens of Leo Lewises every year. 
They're being recruited by multiple schools, schools that you know, some of the best schools in the nation at football. These kids are taking money where they can get it right now against the rules because they're completely broke. It seems to me to be fundamentally unfair to not allow them to benefit and not devise a system in which that can occur. Suffice it to say that the legal fees and costs dwarf the amount at issue. By millions. Many. Because they come from families well below the poverty line. Well below what you consider to be a comfortable life. The NCAA can keep what it keeps. The school keeps what they keep. As long as you don't have to open up that money to pay for the cost of labor, everybody else's slice remains super huge. These kids are supposed to be uh, amateur athletes. Their only compensation is supposed to be you know, tuition, room and board. They're literally the, the opposite of professionals in the NCAA's eyes, despite the fact that you're seeing coaching staff salaries exceed $10 million a year. It's a money-making business. It's not what it was 100 years ago. But the real scandal is the NCAA rules that impoverish these athletes. They're living in some disadvantaged parcel of land somewhere in America. These coaches are going to move on. They're going to be fine. The NCAA model will continue to exist. Over and over again, we see it's these athletes who are the ones who pay the price. We're complicit in all this because we keep watching. We keep going to the message boards and saying, why didn't my coach get this guy? There's been cheating in college sports since the dawn of time. To some extent, thus it was, thus it is, thus it shall be. There's no reason to think, with the structure of amateur athletics and college football specifically, that this couldn't happen next April and the April after that. This is the new reality for what can happen if you're a star college athlete. This will never, ever, ever stop. Bottom of the river. 